Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is John. If you have been watching this channel for any amount of time, you probably know I am Princeton University Press's biggest fanboy. And for the past couple of years, every time they come out with a new catalog of books, which they do every spring and autumn, I send one of their publicity people an email and kindly ask for some of the most interesting things that they have in the catalog. And sometimes if you're lucky and you have a channel where you regularly talk about books, they will oblige in the hopes that uh, I'll get on here and blabber on a little bit about them and maybe pass on the interest to my viewers. And I have two such books, one from the fall catalog of 2023, one from this year's spring catalog, and then after that I have four special books for people who are participants of Historathon. They might be interested especially, <clears throat> excuse me, in those. Let's start with, in chronological order, the book from last fall, fall of 2023. This was the one that struck my interest the most. I didn't realize it was so small at the time, but this is Fool in Search of Henry VIII's Closest Man by Peter K. Anderson. Uh, in some portraits, I'm going to read a little bit of the press matter from the website, not the whole thing. In some portraits, of Henry VIII, there appears another figure, a striking figure, right? Not the king himself, this, this guy, uh, a gaunt and morose looking man with a shaved head, and in one case, a monkey on his shoulder. This is William, or Will, Summer, the king's fool, a celebrated wit who reportedly could raise Henry's spirits and spend many hours with him, often alone. Was Will an artificial fool, a cunning comic who could freely uh, speak freely in front of the king, or a natural fool, someone with intellectual disabilities, like many other members of the profession? And what role did he play in the tumultuous and violent Tudor era? Fool is the first biography of Will Summer, and according to the press matter at least, maybe one of the first biographies ever of a fool who was in a Renaissance court. So, uh, rather short biography. Uh, let me <clears throat> hold up a book for comparison. It's also small in size, too. Um, this is a regular book to compare. So it's somewhat, somewhat small. Uh, about 180 pages, small pages. But um, interesting to see what they might be able to uh, dig up about uh, someone in his court who maybe uh, <laughs> might be a little difficult to find a lot of valuable information about him. I don't know. I had going into the spring of 2024, which is the catalog that had this next book in it, I had obviously quarter one of Historathon first in my mind. And therefore, I immediately went to the um, ancient history, Greece and Rome. A lot of, for some reason, I don't see a lot of Greek stuff in their catalogs, uh, Greek history in their catalogs. So um, I, I picked this always sort of a fascinating topic. Um, this is Katerina Volk's The Roman Republic of Letters. Scholarship, Philosophy, and Politics in the Age of Cicero, or Cicero, if you insist, and Caesar. Uh, it was a period of intense cultural flourishing and extreme political unrest, and the agents of each were often the same people. Uh, members of the senatorial class, like Cicero, uh, Caesar, or, uh, Brutus, uh, Cassius, Cato, Vero, and Nigidius Figulus contributed greatly to the development of Roman scholarship and engaged in a lively 
and often polemical, polemical exchange with each other. These men were also crucially involved in the tumultuous events that brought about the collapse of the Roman Republic, and they ended up on opposite sides in the civil war between Caesar and Pompey in the early 40s. Volk treats the intellectual and political activities of these senator scholars on two sides of the same coin, as two sides of the same coin, exploring how scholarship and statesmanship mutually informed each other, and how the acquisition, organization, and diffusion of knowledge was bound up with the question of what it meant to be a Roman in a time of crisis. So scholarship and maybe oratory and letter writing, knowledge diffusion, the sociology of knowledge, uh, all fascinating topics at a really important historical time. I, this is just uh, fish food for someone like me. So the Roman Republic of Letters. And then I devoted an entire video at around this same time last year telling you about how Princeton University Press uh, supported Historathon 2023 by sending at least me and I think a couple of other people who are participating, especially other co-hosts who are interested in, in contacting them, books for Historathon. And they did me the favor of sending one book for each quarter. They said, just go to our catalog, anything you want. We will, pit, we will send you one for quarter one, two, three, and four. And they were kind enough to do the exact same thing this year when I asked them. So they sent me four books. Four quarters, four books, and I want to show you those now, too. Uh, the first one looks like it's a very closely related subject to the Roman Republic of Letters, same time. Uh, and a lot of potential overlap, too. But, uh, excuse me, uh, very interesting. This is on the much shorter side. Um, only about this much of the book is readable text, and the rest are notes. <laughs> so, well sourced. This is That Tyrant Persuasion. How Rhetoric Shaped the Roman World by J.E. Linden. The typeface is hard to read there for a bit. The assassins of Julius Caesar cried out that they had killed a tyrant, and days later their colleagues in the Senate proposed rewards for this act of tyrannicide. The killers and their supporters spoke as if they were following a well-known script, and they were. Their education was chiefly and rhetoric, and as boys they would have all heard and given speeches on a ubiquitous set of themes, including one asserting that, quote, he who kills a tyrant shall receive a reward from the city. In that tyrant persuasion, J.E. Linden explores how rhetorical education in the Roman world influenced not only the words of literature, but also momentous deeds, like the killing of Caesar. What civic buildings and monuments were built, what laws were made, and ultimately, how the empire itself should be run. That Tyrant Persuasion by J.D. Linden. Next up, I was having some issues with book size. Um, so the, uh, the Will Summer biography is tiny. This is much bigger than I thought. It is basically coffee-sized table a coffee-sized table book, but nevertheless has a lot of text in it that you can basically read like a regular book. The, the pictures in it just are really large. Um, let me get a regular-sized book and hold it up so you can see how much bigger it is. This is um, Building Anglo-Saxon England by John Blair, and you can probably get some hint of the size of it by the fact that I have to use two hands. Um, here is here is a regular size book for comparison. So, like I said, sort of coffee table sized, and uh, the nice thing this has beautiful 
lush, glossy pages, really, really thick paper stock, and a lot of beautiful illustrations, too. Um, sort of stuff like that. Uh, a lot of the illustrations look like they might be better suited for people who are architects, uh, civil engineers, things like that. Um, and you'll see why in a second when I describe the book. But uh, in this beautiful, beautifully illustrated book, we have the latest archaeological discoveries to present a radical reappraisal of the Anglo-Saxon built environment and its inhabitants. John Blair, one of the world's leading experts on this transformative era in England's early history, explains the origins of towns, manor houses, and castles in a completely new way, and sheds new light on the important functions of buildings and settlements in shaping people's lives during the age of the Venerable Bede and King Alfred. So, uh, it is uh, not quite what I expected when I, I didn't carefully read the, the, the material on the website enough very closely. I just saw a book like this. I sort of thought it would be a, uh, I don't know, maybe more of a history book, but it looks like it's more of a analysis of how buildings, how they interact with their environment, how are they, how they were constructed and stuff, uh, etc. But nevertheless, a, a big contender for a reading starting in April and going through June for quarter two. Quarter three. Um, again, you'll notice the theme. Um, history of knowledge, construction of knowledge over time. Topics that are of perennial interest for someone like me. This is you know, basically kind of the same thing uh, all, along general lines, but in another time frame. This is knowledge lost. Excuse the very small print there. This is a new a new view of early modern intellectual history by Martin Molsau. Until now, the history of knowledge has largely been about formal documented accumulation, concentrating on systems, collections, academies, and institutions. The central narrative has been one of advancement, refinement, and expansion. Martin Molsau tells a different story. Knowledge can be lost, manuscripts can be burned, oral history dies with its bearers, new ideas are suppressed by censors. Knowledge lost is a history of efforts from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment to counter such loss. It describes how critics of ruling political and religious regimes developed tactics, tactics to preserve their views, how they buried their ideas and footnotes and illusions, how they, curate, how they circulated their tracts and treatises and handwritten copies, and how they commissioned younger scholars to spread their writings after death. So, uh, countering the suppression of knowledge in all its multifarious forms in early modernity. Fascinating. And last but not least, I'm going to try to prioritize at least two or three of the of these this year. I got two of them read last year, two of the books they sent me. This is one of the ones that is uh, relatively on the shorter side, 220 pages, and also uh, of you know, looks fascinating. This is the Mind in Exile. Thomas Mann in Princeton by Stanley Korngold. In September of 1938, Thomas Mann, the Nobel Prize winning author of Death in Venice and Magic Mountain, fled Nazi Germany for the United States. Heralded as the greatest living man of letters, Mann settled in Princeton, New Jersey, where for nearly three years he was stunningly productive as a novelist, university lecturer, and public intellectual. 
In The Mind in Exile, Stanley Korngold portrays in vivid detail this crucial station in Mon's journey from arch-European conservative to liberal conservative to ardent social democrat. So, uh, a, a history of a rather brief period in Thomas Mann's life that details what sounds like a, a political awakening or political sea change. Again, uh, for my money, one of the, the greatest European writers of the early part of the 20th century, Dr. Faustus is still probably one of my favorite novels, up there with George Eliot. And um, I don't think I've ever read a, even a, a general biography of him, but reading something about a very specific time in his life sounds fascinating to me. So, The Mind in Exile, Tom Schumann in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, these are books that Princeton University was kind enough to send me. Uh, if any of these look interesting, uh, I am going to make an announcement in the next three or four days. This is an announcement that people in uh, the Historathon Discord already know about, so it won't be too much of a surprise to you. But for anyone else who watches this channel who's not participating and who's not in the Discord, it might be a surprise to you. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, for people who are interested in Princeton University publications, who are interested in stuff like this, and a lot of other sort of really smart, well-written, scholarly stuff that's also accessible to a general reader like me. Uh, it, will, it will be of interest to you, so stay tuned for that, and I, I hope to, uh, that you take advantage of it. Let me know if any of these look interesting, and uh, if anyone wants to see a review, I, I plan to get Princeton uh, at least a couple of <laughs> reviews before the year is over. So I will see you soon and talk to you a bit about, in a bit, about Princeton. And like I said, the announcement, I will talk to you later. Bye.